Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about a range, I suppose, projects, and, and uh, um, a number of these, I suppose, flowed on from a GRDC project that finished last year, but also um, I want to cover just the, the increase that we're seeing in solar city, a bit on the decision support tools, um, a lot on comparison trials, a bit on manganese toxicity, and a bit on pH stratification. And I, and I suppose the, uh, just in summary, the GRDC project that finished last year really looked at, at there were components looking at identifying barriers to lime use. Um, we established a state acidity committee, uh, developed a younger acidity champions, that's not me, I should add, um, assisted developer of various decision support tools, um, various training activities of farmers and, and regional projects, and, and also the establishment of the Sydney website, where I suppose a lot of the information is put these days. Now, just sort of going back, I suppose, the, the, uh, um, the smaller map on the left-hand side really was the map that we've used for many years to show where the acid-prone lands in South Australia are, and it tended to focus on the high rainfall, I suppose, cropping and grazing areas, the red and yellow colours there. Um, but we've actually been finding um, the last few years that, that acid soils are appearing, certainly outside that. So we've, we've seen acid soils around Malalara in the lower north. We've seen them on York Peninsula, the home of alkaline soils. We're now getting acid soils. In the southern Mallee, we've, we've seen acid soils developing. So soils under, under pH 5, I'm probably referring to there. And we've, we've ended up having to redo the map. Um, and with, with the intent, I suppose, that, that over the next few decades, within these landscapes that we've highlighted on the, on the new map, I suppose, some, some of the soils within those landscapes will, will develop acid soils. And, and, and you can see even in the June Swale country, that, you know, there's a component of, of acidity developing in, in those situations, depending on the land use. Um, so why are we seeing this sort of increase in soil acidity? And, and my sort of personal trends, I suppose, that I've seen over the last 20, 30 years, we, we've certainly seen in that certainly the medium rainfall increased cropping intensity, perhaps a three to four fold increase in the products being taken off of those paddocks in terms of better yield, um, being cropped a lot more up for regularly, uh, and in some cases straw being removed as well. Um, we've certainly seen a, a sort of mirror, I suppose, in terms of nitrogen fertiliser use where the rates have gone up three to four fold. Um, I can still remember when 20 kilos of N was a high rate of N, which is a bit frightening. <laughs> um, and I suppose you know, those are the two main causes of soil acidification under, under I suppose, the uh, cropping areas. Um, because of that, acidification rates have probably increased four to five times in some of those environments. Um, if, you, if you look at, um, I suppose, an equivalent rate of about, you know, between, say, 80 to 200 kilos per hectare of lime equivalent per year, which is the, sort of the annual acidification, over a 10-year period, that means you need two tonnes of lime to, I suppose, to neutralise the acidification. Um, in, in that, and in the higher rainfall cropping, we've seen sort of rates over 300 kilos per hectare per year. Um, the other thing, I suppose, in the low to medium areas that have got is a lot of low buffered soils as well. So soils that are very, very low buffered. And if you, know, if you actually think about that two tonnes over a 10-year period on a, on a really sandy soil, that might result in about a pH change down to about 30 centimetres of one unit. So you can see them acidify quite quickly in your, when you move into sort of more intensive cropping more products and higher nitrogen fertiliser. Um, the, through the Department for Environment and Water, we've been actually keeping hold of lime stats, and you can actually see, I suppose, the, uh, the recent increase in lime across the state. So we've basically had a bit of a trend around about just after 2000, quite high rates when we had a, a major program going, and it sort of dropped away. And then in recent times, we've seen quite a sharp increase again in, in lime use across the state. We're now using about 160,000 tonnes per hectare per year. Um, and I suppose the, uh, the, if you actually look at those target levels that I've, we've done two ways, I suppose the, the hatch line is really if all the, the 2.1 million hectares of the, the old acid prone areas, um, if, if all that if the, I suppose the acidification is calculated on, on all those hectares, that's actually that target, and you can see it's actually increasing up to four, over four million hectares, so that target will, will, will increase over time. If we look at, I suppose, the, the darker um, continuous line is, is really where we think the, uh, I suppose, the current situation is, is in terms of what percentage of those acid prone areas are actually less than about pH 5.5. And, and we're not doing too bad on that, but there is a, probably about a two million tonnes catch-up phase, I suppose, that we're still behind from historical acidification on these soils. If we were, wanted to get them all up to 5.5, we need an extra two million just to catch up. So I suppose, yeah, that, I suppose the message of that is certainly that the lime stats are going up. Um, 
just in terms of some of the decision support tools, and I won't go into a lot of detail on these, but these are, these are on the website. Um, we've really had to go at, at developing, I suppose, three tools. Lime check is one, which really allows you to actually determine how much lime you need in a certain situation and compares, I suppose, the cost of different lime sources. Um, so now, and you can use the neutralising value, the, the freight costs and the spreading costs in that. Um, the second one, which is the maintenance lime rate calculator, really determines what, what rate of acidification you're getting from your farming system and, and the lime required to counteract that. And the third tool is really just a, a rough tool which helps you determine what's the cost of acidity in your situation. So if you're actually looking at, um, I suppose, the three tools, and this is just one page off, I'm not going to get too much. So the lime check one, you can compare different lime sources uh, and come up with what's the cheapest in your situation. Um, the maintenance lime rate calculator builds, builds on the fertiliser you're using, the, the grain you're growing, the type of soil type, to come up with an acidification rate over time. Um, and I suppose you can use that as an auditing tool. And, and the tool down here, which really is looking at, the, I suppose, the cost of acidification based on your current pH, and these are just using all the best available data we could find in terms of lime responsing. Um, so those tools are certainly on the website. Um, just moving on, I suppose out of the, the uh, decline, I suppose the number one source of lime in South Australia 10 years ago was a soda ash byproduct, uh, neutral lime, and following that I suppose in the sort of the central and the northern region there was a need to really explore other sources of lime, uh, given that the soda ash plant sort of stopped about five years ago. Um, and through that, I suppose, we ended up with two lime comparison trials that we looked at. The Tunkilo uh, site, which is on sand over clay soil types, uh, looked at, I suppose, four liming products plus a calcipril treatment. Um, the, there were two good quality products, the Agricola Lake Deposit and the Southern Lime, uh, which are both quite high NVs. The, the Agricola product's an unusual product in that it clumps together when it's dry, but if, if you wet it up, it, it breaks into very small particles and two coarser products, the, the old Angus and lime, which is available then, There's a, and I suppose a Gore Crush lime. Um, and we saw significant responses in two of the four years of this trial. Um, there was also a complementary pasture site. Um, and, I, and I suppose when you look at the, the responses, the interesting thing that I suppose the, uh, the orange colour, whoop, hang on, knock that up. So the orange colour is really the referring to is the 2015 responses, and the uh, the blue one is the 2017 responses. And of interest there is the the agricola product certainly showed up better in 2015, um, and 2017 I suppose that the fine southern lime product and to a lesser extent the coarser product started to pick up their their responses as well. Um, so I suppose the messages out of this one was that the, the lake bed and the finer product gave a better response. Agricola was probably the, the best in the in early on. Um, we had slightly better, um, if you look at the, the, the bottom slide, I suppose, down here, um, you can actually see that there's been slightly better movement, I suppose, and use of the finer products as well, and the, the two coarse products are still sitting up in the top inch, even after four years, you know, there's a lot of them just sitting up in the top inch of the soil and haven't moved down. Um, and, and I suppose the high rates gave a better yield response than the low rates. Um, The second site, which we're up at Warrabah, which is continuing, I suppose, at the moment through, through other funding and things, um, is with the Law Ag Bureau. And, and again, four products, two rates, sulphur. We put a sulphur treatment in, and the sulphur treatment really is based on if you hadn't limed this site for the next 10 years, this is what your pH is going to end up at. So, so it's really a predictive tool that we can use. Um, the rates on this site were adjusted for the neutralising value. Uh, to, uh, so, so a product that's only 50% would, would be on double the rate. Um, it's been long-term no-till, and we had significant responses in year two, but not, not so much in three and four, although there is, a, there is a trend. And this is year three, I suppose, the site. You can actually see a good response there in the beans, but did not carry through into harvest, and I'll talk a bit about that as, as we go, and, uh, and we think that's sort of one of, one of the issues we've got post-liming. Um, some of the results, so, so yield results, I suppose with the, through here, um, I highlighted that the, the sort of trend is right and we've, you know, we had significance in one year. The, the finer product, I suppose, which is the clear quarry product is slightly in front and the, and the sulphur and, and the control plots are last. Um, 
the high rates have been giving a better response generally compared to the low rates, so six tonnes compared to three tonnes. And I think of importance in this one really is that the, uh, we can still see in this profile an acid part of the profile at about 75 mils. So perhaps the reason we're not getting it, you know, as much response in the grain as what we'd like, I'm seeing, we're seeing them early on and they're disappearing, is that the roots are getting down in these acid layers and getting, still getting impacted from, the, from the, what we're calling an acid throttle in this situation. And this issue sort of seems to be emerging across under, under no tool and I'll, I'll cover a bit more stuff that we've done on that. Um, just briefly, I suppose, we did look at manganese toxicity, I suppose. I mean, traditionally, acidity has been linked to aluminium toxicity, and I suppose in the eastern states, they always talk about manganese toxicity as well. Um, symptoms include chlorosis, where you see it, and necrosis of the leaf trips. And interesting, on the Warabra trials side, I suppose, we were getting quite high um, levels of, uh, of manganese in both the, the sulphur treatments and to a lesser, lesser extent in the controls. And, I had a look at all the SASPAS database information for the soil and plant and, and it was a really very low incidence that you could find high plant manganeses or, or at, you know, at or even close to the toxic levels. Um, so we, st we probably haven't changed what we think. We still expect manganese tox toxicity will become a bit more common and probably on the loamier soils in the mid-north as they acidify. That's a very common New South Wales and often linked to sort of warm wet springs as well but we're unlikely to see much on all the sandy stuff where often it's the other way around. Um, so just following on, I suppose, just a bit on pH stratification, and this is looking at soils post-liming, uh, and this is, this is a site at Kapunda here, and, and, and I suppose this, this site, the farmer's told me he's limed it three times, it's been limed for 15 years, and it's been under no-till. Um, and you can sort of see the, the shape of sampling that we did, so it's really very intense looking sampling, both horizontally and vertically. And, and I suppose what of interest is here, when, and this, it's not a controlled traffic site, but a no-till site, so it's not much change but, um, horizontally, so you'd sort of say, well, that's a, something positive out of it, but, but when you sort of look down through the profile, um, we're still getting quite acid pHs, you know, under four and a half at that sort of, um, or pretty well under, under sort of uh, five centimetres, so within the top four inches, we are seeing uh, acidity, I suppose, and quite acid layers there. And had a look, I suppose, on a, a number of sites last year, and a similar pattern emerged that, that on long term no till, we're not getting movement of the lime down through uh, the profile to uh, 10 centimetres. And I suppose what it means in, in that sense is, you know, we've, we've, we'll, we'll get some response from liming, but we're not going to get the full response, and particularly the sensitive plants would be affected by having sort of these acid layers in there. Um, so what that sort of means, I suppose, is, you know, are we going to have to, um, we, we probably need to start looking more closely at the pH on some of these areas that have long-term no-till, had a history of liming. Um, do we need to change our soil testing protocols? To me, you, you won't pick this up with a 0 to 10 where you just tend to mix all those layers up. So you need to either break that up into 5 or 5 to 10 or get out with a field kit and dabble around with that or something, to, to really have a look at, at the stratification. Um, the treat, there's a range of treatment options from you know, incorporating the lime, but also looking at you know, can, can we achieve something similar with higher rates of lime, are there differences between the different qualities, uh, are there more soluble products we can use, uh, deeper injection and complementary products, I suppose, as well, as well as perhaps biological incorporation. So there's a range of things we need to have a look at to sort of get a more even pH down the profile. And it's also possible in some of these sites that they're just physically not getting enough lime, so that it never really gets down to those layers. What this means for growers, I'll just finish off, I suppose, is soil acidity is increasing. Um, the cause and the treatments, I think, are probably, to some extent, well established. There's new decision support tools available. Um, but you, you also need to look at, I suppose, this pH stratification issue post-liming. And I'll leave it there. OK, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Yep, so I'm going to talk about uh, soil pH mapping and, um, and, and mostly about how we're applying that data to make better decisions. So um, the machine that we use for our pH mapping is, uh, is the Verus pH uh, manager, which is the, the picture that we've got there. So um, basically that uses, well, it's measuring two things. You can see there um, these disks here are measuring EC. 
in here there's a, uh, a, um, a shoe that samples up and down, uh, taking a sample about every 10 to 20 seconds. When it goes down, it, it scoops up a sample of soil, lifts that up against a pair of pH electrodes, which are sitting in here. Um, it takes 10 to 15 seconds to settle on a reading. It records that with the GPS. The shoe then drops down to take another sample, and a couple of water jets turn on to um, clean the electrodes, ready for the next sample to be presented. And it travels across the, the paddock, sampling that on the go um, at about 10 kilometres per hour. And with that sort of sampling frequency, running on transects of, of about 36 metres, it's giving us about seven to eight samples per hectare. I guess just some take home messages up front. So soil pH can be highly variable and um, that's probably not surprising to most of you in the room. We, this then leads to improved efficiency of liming programs by just targeting lime to where it's required. Um, some other things that I think we can start to improve on just the pH mapping is incorporating soil texture into the lime rate calculations. And I also think the pH data has other applications other than just targeting lime. So this is basically what the data looks like when you, after you've mapped the paddock. Um, these are all individual points that were sampled by the Verus machine. That roughly gives you about seven per hectare in that map. We're then interpolating that data to give, create a surface here showing the range in pH, ranging in this paddock from less than five and a half um, on about seven hectares up to over eight on, on 10 hectares from the red to the blue there. So then we can then build that into a, a lime prescription. Um, to calculate the lime rates, we obviously need a, a target um, pH that we want to achieve. Um, we also need to know the lime quality that we're uh, going to apply and we're also um, building that soil texture factor into the, into the calculation as well to basically generate a, a line prescription map like this where anything above a pH of six isn't going to receive any lime and, uh, and then anything below that is incrementally increased by, based on what the starting soil pH was. And so in this case, using the Colpara product with an effective neutralising value of about uh, 65% and, um, and targeting mostly sandy soils, there's going to be 51 tonne of, of lime applied to this, this paddock. I've deliberately not um, done an economic analysis on, on this example and in many of the examples that, or paddocks that we're working in. The reason for that is the, the general um, analysis is to say, well, what's the standard rate that you would apply to this paddock um, and how much lime have you saved by doing a, uh, a lime, a prescription map and applying the lime accordingly. This is in an area that has never traditionally received any lime. Um, in the absence of having this data, it, this paddock was not going to receive your standard application of, say, two tonne to the hectare of lime. If that was the case, I could say, well, in this paddock, we would have saved 290 tonnes, but that would be misleading. I mean, there's soils in this paddock that had um, pH over eight, and uh, clearly they were never going to receive any lime. So I think a better economic analysis would be to work out what the, uh, what the um, opportunity cost would be from not liming the, the low pH soils um, and what the yield cost would be if they continued to uh, remain acidic rather than looking at it from a lime saving perspective, at least in this case. Um, just Touching briefly on, on sampling intensity, there's basically two um, methods for uh, mapping soil pH, um, the Verus being one and grid soil sampling being the other. Um, with grid soil sampling, potentially the, uh, the soil sample itself will give you a more accurate um, soil pH result. Um, the trade-off is the reduced sampling intensity where in the same paddock, if I reduce the sampling intensity from seven samples per hectare here um, to one sample per hectare here, you can see the difference there. We've got some quite um, rapid soil pH changes going over these dunes, which is where most of the, 
the low pH uh, samples were coming from. And in some cases, we're only getting sort of one sample um, on the dune each time we, we cross that dune. And, and so once you interpolate that data, while the maps have got similar spatial trends, where the boundaries are that actually are going to be changing your rates, um, they're a lot more fuzzy. And, uh, and so if you've got soil types where soil pH is going to be changing quickly, um, the sampling intensity needs to be a bit higher than one sample per hectare. I'd suggest two or more. Um, I guess just uh, an example here um, of a paddock that we started working in in 2014 where we went and did some, um, it was the first time the client had taken on the paddock and we just went to do some basic soil testing to get a feel for um, the starting levels in the paddock. We weren't just looking at pH but other things and the paddock was just uh, sampled blind in two different zones where samples one to six were um, targeting a sandy soil and uh, samples seven to 11 here on the, the heavier soil types in the paddock thinking that um, that was going to zone it well enough to see the main differences that were occurring in the paddock. And we can see from that that the average pH in both of those zones was 7.6 and 7.7, .7, so um, neutral to alkaline and, and no acidity issues to be concerned about. The paddock was mapped with Averis in 2017 subsequently, and this is what the, the uh, soil pH map looked like. And so we can see where those samples were taken from in relation to the, uh, um, the original sample point. So here's a sandy soil types, here's a um, heavier soil type. Now in general, in general, the heavier soil types, we got it about right where um, you look at the average of what the Verus was sampling, and it came out at 7.7, .7, which is exactly the same as what the, the, um, the cores initially gave us. But when we look at uh, the sandier soil types in that paddock, our um, standard test in 2014 gave us an average of 7.6, whereas you look at what the, the Verus was averaging for those same six points, and um, it's actually uh, only 6.4, and there's large areas in here that are um, less than six and some areas less than five. So it just goes to show that if you're sort of sampling blind, you can, can miss some things um, quite dramatically there. Part of what I think happened here and why the average of these points is not the, the same is some of these sites are sort of um, uh, have landed in the acidic zone, but then point three and point six here um, are on more of an alkaline sand, which when you uh, looked at the sand itself, you could see a bit of carbonate in it. And I think when you put all that in the bag with some of the acidic soil, you mix it up and send it off to the lab, there's a bit of neutralization happening in the bag as well. And hence, um, the average of the sample that ended up in the lab from that sampling was, was actually a lot higher than what it was when you averaged the points individually. Um, just quickly, so I think we can improve our lime rate calculations by uh, accounting for uh, soil texture. In some cases, uh, we've got variable soil texture. That could be influencing the lime rate calculation as much as the um, starting pH is. So here's our soil pH map. We can transfer that straight into a lime prescription map. It's going to suggest we apply 436 tonne of lime at these rates. Um, but that's using a soil texture factor of two for a sandy soil, where this is in a dune swale landscape and, and the soil texture is actually quite variable. So we're measuring soil EC as we're going with the Verus. Um, we could use that EC as a surrogate for soil texture as well, where um, the sands, we might use a, a texture factor of two, the sandy loams, a texture factor of three, and the clay loam, a texture factor of four. And if we apply that in this example, it's going to increase the rates on those heavier textured soils and instead of applying 430 tonne of lime, it's now suggesting we apply 570 tonne of lime. And I think including that extra information is going to give us more um, precise rate calculations. Finally, um, at the other end of the pH spectrum, um, there's some important agronomic things that we could be taking notice of as well. Uh, sort of. These charts have been um, around for a long time where we can look at the, the interactions between soil pH and nutrient availability. And 
in our alkaline soils, we sort of know that um, as pH increases, um, the availability of phosphorus and the phosphorus buffering index will increase. So this is just data from, from one farm where we looked at the, the pH um, in calcium chloride measured by the Verus um, and in relation to the, the phosphorus buffering index on that farm. And generally the PBI was quite low for P, uh, soils with pH less than 7, but once we started to increase above there, um, the PBI increased. And so how could we apply that information? Um, I think it could have a fit in terms of variable rate phosphorus um, prescription maps. I guess a common use for variable rate P is to just use a, a replacement factor and use a grain yield map. As in this example, um, grain yield map here and transfer that straight into a P replacement map where you just put back in what was taken out from each part of the paddock. I think we could improve that quite significantly by incorporating a bit more information. So here I'm suggesting we can include the pH map where we know these high pH soils above 7.5 have a high PBI, high P fixation. Um, we know the areas, the red areas that are less than 6 have got low phosphorus fixation. Um, we can incorporate that with our yield data and possibly even some NDVI data to give us a more refined um, phosphorus rate map which uh, probably more reflects the responsiveness of the different zones within the paddock rather than just working purely off grain yield. All of this though is um, based on my best guess at the moment and um, how to actually incorporate those different data layers probably needs a bit, a bit more work. That's um, just summarising I think the, the take home messages at the moment and so we'll open it up for questions.